Hello everyone, welcome to my The Young and the Restless Homies official channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Chelsea informed Dr. Alcott in her office that she had a lot of faith in therapy and treatment, but she wasn't sure if she could handle Connor's OCD. Dr. Alcott assured Chelsea that if she had the necessary tools, she would be able to help Connor. Chelsea remained anxious that she might make matters worse for her son, if she hadn't already. Chelsea revealed that she had once tried suicide by standing on the verge of a building's top, preparing to jump, since she believed it was the only way to escape tremendous anguish. Chelsea fantasized that her own obsessive thoughts were identical to Connor's, and that the only reason she was still alive was that a friend had arrived in time to prevent her from jumping. Dr. Alcott suspected that Chelsea had sought assistance. Chelsea acknowledged that she had been admitted to an inpatient institution and had been undergoing therapy ever since. The doctor praised her for her remarkable strength. Chelsea moaned that while she was proud of her accomplishments, she was beginning to believe that she had passed something dreadful onto her boy, which was unbearable. Chelsea added that Connor was a sensitive child who picked up on her emotions and she didn't want to bring him any more misery. Dr. Alcott emphasized that there was no question of fault, and it was not too late to seek therapy. Chelsea described how she had played out for years to evade the voices in her head, but they eventually pursued her onto a ledge. Chelsea repeated Connor's sentiments about hating himself and having dangerous ideas, and she was concerned that they would drive him over the brink before he received help. Chelsea said she was not attempting to make the situation about herself. Dr. Alcott imagined that what Chelsea regarded as a liability was actually a strength because Chelsea's own mental health issues made her sensitive to Connor's needs, and Chelsea recognized that there was no easy answer. Chelsea inquired whether the doctor truly believed the residential facility was the best option. The doctor indicated that the treatment was crucial in assisting Connor in dealing with the uncomfortable sensations that triggered his ritualistic habits, and she urged Chelsea to make a decision as quickly as possible. Chelsea cried as she slumped onto a waiting room chair after leaving the office. In his dorm room, Connor lathered his hands in sanitizer. Adam volunteered to help Connor put away the items he'd gotten from home, but Connor insisted that his father would do it incorrectly. Adam pointed out that Connor had never explained why he wanted to change rooms, but Connor refused to discuss it. Adam suspected that it was a problem with another student or that Connor disliked the hue of the walls. It was me, Connor said, explaining that he had been unable to stay in his former room due to me and my craziness. Adam insisted that the word crazy was just OCD talking, since Connor was the best kid ever. As Connor focused on organizing the books on his shelf, Adam returned the conversation to the room change. Adam stated he was trying to understand so he could assist Connor. Connor revealed that the difficulty had been the room number, and Adam remembered that Connor preferred the number seven or numbers that could be divided by seven. Connor revealed that his prior room number had been 23, and two plus three equaled five, which was horrible. Adam revealed that his favorite number was 21, which Connor assumed was because Adam liked to gamble in Las Vegas. Adam was perplexed as to who had told his son that, and Connor explained that Johnny had overheard his parents discussing Adam's previous life in Vegas, where he had spent time playing cards. Adam muttered that it had been a lifetime, and he inquired about Connor's thoughts on the doctor's advice retreat. Connor complained that it was a mental hospital, but Adam claimed that it was a place where people could help him. Connor protested that his parents had said they didn't have to make a decision yet. Adam clarified that they had agreed to talk about it, which is exactly what they were doing. Connor admitted that he did not want to go because he was terrified. Adam assured that he and Chelsea would do everything possible to make things easy, and he pointed out that they could get the room number ahead of time. Connor stated that he knew where everything was at his school and at home. However, he wouldn't know where anything was at the institution and he would be alone. Adam was confident that Connor would make friends. 
Connor contended that he didn't have friends at school, so there was no reason to expect he'd have them at the hospital. Adam swore everything would be fine. Not if I have to go to that place, Connor explained. Adam suggested that they observe how things unfolded, as they were only beginning the process and had made no decisions. Adam offered that he and Connor go get some pizza, but Connor muttered that he wasn't hungry. Adam proposed that Connor demonstrate him how to properly unpack his backpack. Connor yelled that he didn't want to be there because he despised it, and he didn't want to go to the facility for crazies. Adam vowed that the facility could help Connor, but Connor cried that nothing could. Adam told Connor that he and Chelsea would be with him every step of the way, whether it was the residential program or something else. Connor begged Adam to take him home instead of going to the place. Absolutely, Adam said, as Connor threw himself into his father's arms. Later, Adam, Chelsea, and Connor arrived at Crimson Lights. Adam lured Connor with a brownie. But Connor was concerned that his mother had changed something in his room and wanted to go upstairs to correct it. Chelsea promised she had not touched anything and advised they talk about the decision they needed to make. Connor walked sullenly to the patio. Chelsea stated that Dr. Alcott advised the ERP residential program. Adam pointed out that it had been a hard day and suggested that they discuss it later. Connor grumbled about being fatigued, but Chelsea refused to dismiss the topic since it was too serious. Chelsea understood Connor's fear about falling behind in his homework, but she promised to keep him on track while he was in therapy. Chelsea sympathized that the prospect of attending a retreat was frightening, but she assured them that they'd find the proper place and things will improve. Connor snapped that his father had told him he didn't have to go if he didn't want to, which he didn't. Chelsea scowled at Adam. Kyle had a feeling at the Abbott estate that there was more to Claire's story than she and Victoria were willing to reveal. Summer recalled Victoria's careful wording, but she was struck by Claire's instant connection with Harrison. Kyle remarked that watching his son grin had been a welcome change of pace. Summer wanted their son to feel safe again. She was receptive to the notion of interviewing Claire, but she needed to conduct some research first. Kyle expressed concern that Claire might not be interested. Summer noted that Claire had expressed an interest in working with youngsters. Kyle argued that Claire didn't really want to be a nanny, but it was worth a chance. Summer sought to go into the parts of the story Victoria had not shared with them. She used her phone to send a message. Nick arrived at the Newman property and called for his parents. Victor told Nick that Nikki, Victoria, and Claire had gone to face Jordan. Nick thought it was a horrible idea, and Victor admitted that he had been reluctant to agree to it. Victor added that Nikki had hoped it would allow her to restore her own strength while remaining sober. Victor assumed that Victoria and Claire had felt it would be empowering to show Jordan that she could no longer terrorize them. Nick reflected that they had strong women in their household. Summer came at the ranch and embraced Nick and Victor. Summer remembered running into Victoria and Claire at Crimson Lights, and she was amazed that the baby everyone had assumed was dead was actually alive and well. Summer revealed that Harrison had fallen in love with Claire right away, but Victoria appeared to be reluctant to discuss Claire's past. Summer wondered what she needed to know about her new cousin. Nick admitted Claire's past was complicated and terrible. Summer was astounded to find that Claire had been involved in a plot to murder the Newmans. Victor said that Claire had been raised by her aunt to despise them, and Claire had been just as much of a victim as the others. Summer insisted that it did not excuse Claire's acts, and she questioned why Claire was not in prison. Victor explained that Michael had made sure Claire was admitted to a mental institution, and Summer discovered Claire had been freed from the psych ward rather than the hospital. Victor asked Summer to give Claire the benefit of the doubt and consider everything she had been through. Summer mentioned what Claire had put their family through, but Victor insisted that they accept Claire into their family. Summer noted that Nick had not said much. Nick admitted that it was difficult for him because Claire was one of the reasons his mother's sobriety had been broken. 
and he was unable to forgive and forget after witnessing Nikki's agony. He promised to be cordial and give Claire a chance for Victoria's sake, but he knew it would take time to recover from what Claire and Jordan had done to his mother. Victor reassured them that Jordan was being dealt with as they chatted. Summer returned to the Abbott estate, telling Kyle that it was a good thing they had investigated Claire's background. Summer believed it would be a huge mistake to allow Claire care for Harrison or even be alone with him because she was emotionally and mentally unstable. Summer couldn't believe Claire would be accepted into the family after what she had done. A bodyguard took Nikki, Victoria, and Claire to the rundown facility where Jordan was imprisoned. They heard Jordan beating on the door, and Claire said dryly that her aunt did not appear happy. Just wait until she sees us, Victoria answered. Jordan shouted out to see if anyone was there, and she begged for aid since she had been confined inside to die like an animal. Jordan heard the door being unbolted and began to thank God until she spotted Nikki, who informed her that it was not a rescue party. Jordan told the women to leave, but Nikki dismissed the notion that Jordan had any influence there. Jordan shouted that she could take them all, but Nikki warned her not to try anything. Claire chirped that the three of them could easily handle Jordan, who insulted Claire for suddenly showing bravery. Nikki motioned for the security to remain outside, and Jordan inquired about the nature of the sick tea party. Claire joked that Jordan appeared to have broken a nail, as if she expected to be able to scratch her way out. Nikki huffed that Jordan wasn't as smart as she thought she was, and she pointed out that being locked up against one's will was not fun. Jordan wondered if they were just there to gloat. Nikki claimed that after all the hell Jordan had put them through, she couldn't think of a nicer way to spend the afternoon. Jordan threatened to haunt the Newmans every moment of the day and night for the rest of their lives. Claire recalled Jordan's dramatic nature, although it was less effective than she remembered. Nikki declared that it was finished, and Jordan encouraged her to tell herself so while she was alone, while pouring herself a long glass of vodka. Jordan suspected that Nikki was drinking because she needed to confront Jordan. Nikki said that she hadn't had a drink in days and had regained her sobriety after Jordan had stolen it. Victoria compared it to Jordan stealing her daughter, although Claire was still at home. Claire said that Jordan had stolen her life, but she was reclaiming it with a loving family, and it was much better than she could have imagined. Jordan chastised them for their dumb whimpering and fretting about what she'd done to them, when it was exactly what they deserved. She questioned if they truly believed it would fix all of their problems. Nikki reminded Jordan which of them had been foolish enough to be duped into being locked in a basement. Jordan claimed that the passage of time had provided her with clarity, since she had studied the Newmans for years and foretold nothing but disaster and doom. Jordan implied that Claire was still full of hatred and would try to kill them again, possibly with success the next time. Victoria argued that Claire's previous behavior had been entirely due to Jordan's influence. Jordan countered that she had reared and loved Claire, and that Victoria couldn't truly love Claire unless she trusted her. You used me, Claire said angrily. Jordan noticed Claire's dislike for her and warned Victoria that Claire may turn on her as well. Victoria huffed, claiming that Jordan could not do or say anything to make her question her daughter. Jordan challenged Victoria to accept Claire into her house, but encouraged her to sleep with one eye open. Jordan screamed that Claire had duped them all by posing as Nikki's professional, honest assistant, and that Claire was defrauding them by claiming to be Victoria's long-lost daughter. Claire asserted that she had changed since she had received help and understood what love and family were. Jordan wondered how much heart Victoria had left when she couldn't even hold on to a man or a home. Jordan was enraged that Victoria's only source of motivation was the Newman's grandeur and fame. Shut up, bitch, Nikki demanded. Jordan teased Nikki, saying she knew that she wanted to go to the liquor shop, grab the nicest bottle of vodka, and suck it down to get rid of everything. Nikki declared that she had survived Jordan's attack on her sobriety, and revealing Jordan as a miserable human being served as another reminder that Nikki was much stronger when she wasn't drinking. Jordan wished Nikki had shared her excitement with her poor sponsor Seth, 
who died as a result of Nikki's actions. Nikki said that Seth died because Jordan was a serial killer. Nikki hoped that the image of the three Newman women joined in love and power would haunt Jordan for the rest of her life, as Jordan would have plenty of time to think about it while in prison. Jordan was surprised that Nikki didn't just want to keep her there. Nikki acknowledged that she would prefer Jordan never escape the hellhole she had created. But the next best thing was knowing Jordan would waste away in her cage. Jordan explained to Claire that all he had done was revenge her sister. But the Newmans could get away with anything because of their name. Jordan feared Claire would be the next black sheep, much like her uncle Adam, but even worse because she was part Howard. Claire insisted that Jordan couldn't get to her anymore, and she was exactly where she wanted to be. Jordan hoped that bowing over to those vipers would make Claire miserable. Victoria cooed that their family loved and accepted Claire unconditionally, whereas Jordan would die alone. Jordan prophesied that someone would die sooner rather than later, and she took a vial from beneath the soiled mattress. Jordan reminded everyone that she was in charge. Jordan claimed that the toxin in the vial was more dangerous than the one she had used at the lake house. She indicated that it had been her initial idea to kidnap Nikki and Victor and administer it to them there. But she'd moved on to plan B. Jordan groused that she was tired of the Newman's arrogant yapping, believing that their money and fame gave them authority. Nikki said that Jordan was the one with delusions of grandeur, claiming she was righting wrongs while her life had been meaningless. Nikki imagined that no one would listen to Jordan's experiences in prison since she would be just another inmate assigned a number. Jordan cackled, revealing that the vial was not Nikki's only ticket out. It's mine, Jordan triumphantly said as she chugged the contents of the vial. Tata, Claire, she exclaimed, adding that they might all go to hell. Jordan demanded to know Claire's farewell words for the lady who had loved and sacrificed for her. Jordan lurched over to the bed, the toxins taking their toll. Victoria considered whether they should assist, but Nikki insisted that they had not compelled Jordan to take the poison. Victoria said that Jordan had swallowed it to evade justice. Claire reflected on what her aunt had put them through, and if Jordan deserved to live or die. So what do you guys think about this update? Let me know in the comments below. And if you like my videos, please press like and subscribe for more. I'll see you guys next time.